Okay, we are being recorded. Now here is the, uh, welcome to the lecture number 10. Just a few announcements before we uh, go on. Uh, so as you probably noticed, the problem sheet number four is already posted on the uh, web page. Uh, the deadline is shortly before Christmas. Let me let me perhaps share screen. Yeah, so there is the problem sheet four due on December twenty second, and the problem sheet the, the deadline for the problem sheet is December 9th. It's also it's also coming. Uh, okay. Is there anything else? Uh, okay, I think we can go uh, back to the lecture. So we will begin by a board lecture. Uh, if you recall, last time we were calculating the Riemann tensors for two metrics, uh, the second of which was the Rindler's, basically the Minkowski metric in Rindler's accelerating coordinates. We have calculated, it's written explicitly here, uh, we have calculated the Christoffel symbols for this metric. And we did a few steps towards uh, calculating the Riemann tensor. This is a flat space, this is effectively flat space time. So we strongly suspect this should be equal to zero, all of the relevant curvature tensor components, but we still need to prove that. Uh, we managed to notice that there is basically only two co components of the Riemann tensor. Uh, plus, of course, the ones which with uh, inverted uh, last two indices, uh, which have any chance of not being zero because quite a lot of gamma symbols and their derivatives seems to be equal to zero. So we will now finish this uh, example by calculating these two uh, components of the curvature tensor. Let me stop sharing this screen and I will share the blackboard. Okay, so uh, Minkowski space time in Ringler's accelerating coordinates. And this is continue, the continuation of the previous lecture. So we have managed to prove that gamma zero three zero, which is the same as gamma zero zero three, that's one over a, and that gamma three zero zero, well, this is simply a. And it's easy to show from that, that the derivatives of the Christopher symbols. The only non-vanishing derivatives of Christopher symbols are uh, gamma 0, 3, 0, um, 3, because A corresponds to the third, the last coordinate. And that's the same as the gamma, of course, 0, 3, 3. That's minus one over a squared. And then gamma three, zero, zero, three, that's simply equal to one. Uh, the only two components we need to calculate will be R three, zero, zero, three. Let's try to calculate that one. That's the zero derivative of gamma. Um, three zero three minus the three derivative of gamma three zero zero plus gamma um, three sigma zero gamma sigma zero three minus gamma three sigma three gamma sigma 
zero, zero. Right, right. Okay. So obviously there is no non-vanishing gamma three three zero, and also the zero derivatives always vanish. So this is equals to zero. This is equals to zero, and this is just one. Now out of this guy. So let's begin with this guy. Uh, so there is sigma runs from zero to three. Uh, the zero cannot contribute because we don't have gamma zero, zero, zero. Uh, neither does one and two. Uh, the three component would be gamma three, 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 zero, zero, zero. It doesn't contribute either. So this is all zero. But we also have a term from here. Uh, and the potentially contributing would be three zero 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 three three zero zero uh, zero zero three and it does contribute and gamma three 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 zero three but it doesn't because gamma with double three is equal to equal to zero uh, and this thing here is just this times that. And this is one. So altogether we have one minus one equals to zero. Good. And the last component is gamma zero three zero three. Uh, if you are clever, you may notice that since the metric is diagonal. Um, uh, this is actually related to this component over here uh, by relatively simple change of sign because the metric itself, let me show you the metric. I'll write it here. Uh, that's minus a square d sigma square plus d x square plus d y square plus d a squared. Uh, so lowering the index over here will produce uh, minus a squared. Uh, then we could switch the, so we'll, let me write it this way. This thing here is the same as r0303 uh, and here we have raised the index that will be minus one over a squared. Yeah, but that's one over a squared r three zero zero three. And raising the third index changes nothing. So this is one over r squared r three zero zero three. So it's zero. There is a relation between these two components. So effectively, this also has to be zero. Although if you, if, if you wish, we could try to calculate it exact, uh, explicitly again from this formula uh, and show that this is zero. So indeed, this is a flat space time. There, there exists uh, Cartesian coordinates with constant uh, metric co uh, coordinates, uh, coefficients, because all components of the Riemann tensor globally vanish. Or anything else? No. Yeah. And that's it. Do you have any questions to this particular example? Okay. You probably don't. So let's have a look at. So the next topic will be a slides lecture. So let me stop sharing screen. I discovered a new option I didn't know about, which is switching on the pointer. Now you should be able to see the position of my pointer uh, at all times, because before that, the arrow tend, I noticed that the arrow tends to disappear on your screen in, in an unpredictable way. Now you should be able to see what I'm pointing to 
at any moment. Sorry that I discovered this option only recently. Okay, so the next topic will be the geodesic deviation equation. Uh, this is this topic. Uh, the reason why I want to discuss this is is twofold. So for one, uh, last time we were discussing the uh, the Riemann tensor, the cur space time curvature, and I have given you some geometric intuitions behind that. What what it means geometrically. Uh, but now I would also like to present you more a more physical understanding of what the Riemann tensor is in general relativity in the context of the gravity theory. And the shortest answer is that, well, there's many answers to this question, but one of the simplest is that it's uh, appropriate components of the Riemann tensor uh, govern the tidal forces uh, and extended body experiences when, when, it is, uh, when it is in the gravitational field. So let's begin by, the, by defining what the tidal forces are. So they're basically the simplest effect of the gravitational field not being quite uniform uh, over the size of the system we are considering. Uh, and they appear also in free falling frame. So I see we've got a large mass M. We've got a, a, an orange body undergoing free fall, but we also have a couple of bodies orbiting next to it uh, on slightly displaced uh, positions. It's well known that in this case, on the longer on the longer term, the observer will notice that uh, even though these objects were initially stationary with respect to, to, to the central observer, in the long term they will not be. And the reason is, of course, the non-uniformity of the gravitational field. The gravitational force is stronger closer to the body, it's weaker uh, further away from, from the body, and it also has a bit different direction when we move up or down. And because of that, uh, the accelerations all of those objects uh, experience is not exactly the same. There will be a relative acceleration between these, these bodies. Uh, here, I assume that all of these bodies are in free fall, but you can also consider an elastic body um, uh, of appropriate size uh, sitting in this gravitational field. And in that case, the effect of these tidal forces is usually some kind of elastic deformation of this body. Uh, the important point is that it also appears in the free falling frame. In fact, it, it, these forces are easiest to, to, to uh, analyze in the free falling frame. Let's begin by considering the Newtonian approach. So uh, X zero corresp corresponds to the position of the central body. Uh, it's a free falling body, so it's uh, undergoing the motion here, uh, accelerated motion, and here you've got the equations of motion. Uh, but then we also considered a slightly displaced uh, body, for example, this one. Uh, and we only, uh, and we approximate the uh, gravitational force by its first order uh, uh, Taylor series. So we take the second derivative of five times delta xj. And in that case, we can easily write down the equations for this deviation vector as delta xj equal to the uh, minus the second derivatives of the potential times delta xj. So there will be some kind of residual acceleration between these two bodies proportional to the displacement of each of these bodies. Uh, uh, and the linear transformation is given by the matrix of the second derivatives of the potential. This is also known as the tidal tensor. Uh, yeah, it's responsible for tidal deformations. In particular, it's also uh, responsible for the tides in, on the Earth's ocean. Now let's think about the, the general relativity description of this situation. So we consider a time-like geodesic corresponding to the central bod body plus a slight perturbation of this geodesic. It turns out that in order to derive the equations governing the situation, it's better to uh, consider a slightly larger setup, slightly more complicated than the one in the Newtonian case. Instead of one geodesic plus perturbation, we'll consider a whole one parameter family of geodesics. So we've got uh, a family of ge geodesics gamma epsilon, where epsilon uh, uh, is an index uh, pointing to a particular geodesic. And on the other hand, 
the geodesics are themselves are parameterized by lambda. So lambda is, is the affine parameter along each of these geodesics, and epsilon defines a particular geodesic. We can write it down as x mu of lambda epsilon. The geodesic corresponding to epsilon equal to zero will be called the fiducial geodesic. It will be our central body. Uh, and we can differentiate this function x mu of lambda epsilon uh, by lambda. This defines the tangent vector to the fiducial geodesics, but also to all other geodesics. Uh, dotted line here corresponds to the points uh, along different geodesics, uh, which correspond to the same value of the affine parameter lambda. And the, 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 the solid lines are the geodesics themselves parameterized by epsilon. Now, what we can do uh, is the, we can approximate the position of a geodesic close to the fiducial one by the Taylor series. So this is the position of the uh, fiducial uh, timeline geodesic, x mu of lambda zero, plus the first order term in epsilon. This derivative here, the derivative of x mu with respect to epsilon for a particular position lambda and for epsilon equal to zero. This is something we'll call the separation vector. Uh, if you want an intuition, I think this big figure here represents this very well. It simply tells you, uh, it simply direct, direct, uh, exactly along this dotted uh, curve corresponding to uh, the same value of the affine parameter. So this epsilon, this psi uh, times epsilon connects two infinitesimal geodesics or two points on infinitesimal closed geodesics, uh, which correspond to the same lambda. And now it turns out that this vector psi mu uh, has to satisfy its own uh, of the ordinary differential equations along the null geodesics, geodesic over here, which we can write this way. It's, it's a second order derivative, second order ordinary differential equations um, consisting of, first of all, a term which is the second derivative of this vector psi covariant derivative uh, along the, the curve gamma zero. So the second derivative with respect to the tangent vector t minus the curva, Riemann curvature tensor appropriately contracted with the uh, tangent vector to our, to our fiducial geodesic t and psi. So forgetting about t, this equation has a, a rather similar structure to the equation before. It's a second order differential equations for the components of xi, uh, and it's also linear in the sense that the right hand side term is basically uh, a, lead, a matrix times xi. The physical interpretation is that Riemann governs the tidal forces. Uh, we'll now derive this equation on the blackboard, but before that, do you have any questions to the geodesic division equation and the setup we consider here. Okay, I can't hear any questions, so let me share my screen. Uh, yeah, let's go back to the blackboard again. Mm -hmm. The new topic is geodesic division equation. Okay, I need to open my notes. Yeah, so the setup is exactly what uh, what it was before. So we've got our fiducial uh, primal geodesic, which I call gamma zero. It forms a one parameter family. So we've got the neighboring 
so does x nearby. It's comma epsilon over here. Uh, we've got the constant lambda curves. Um, yes, and we've got the two vectors. The tangent vector mu and the vector psi. Um, yeah. We've got this one parameter family, which we can also write as x mu lambda epsilon. Uh, yeah, and we know that the position of the neighboring geodesic can be approximated as the position uh, of the fiducial geodesic plus. Uh, dx mu over d epsilon equals to psi mu epsilon plus higher order terms. Uh, now, sometimes this whole thing over here is called the separation vector. But sometimes it's only this coefficient, which is called the separation vector. It depends on your uh, convention. Uh, uh, including epsilon simply means that we physically rescale this vector to be infin infinitesimally or very small. However, the resulting equation is scale invariant, so it doesn't really matter mathematically. Uh, an important thing to notice is that for any function, the derivative with respect to epsilon, that's simply uh, psi mu times the derivative with respect to uh, times the gradient and the derivative with respect to lambda that's basically t mu times the gradient. It's just an identity. Mm, yeah, and we assume that the uh, all these curves are geodesics. So we assume that nabla t, t mu is equal to zero, zero everywhere. Okay. Uh, in principle, we could try to mimic the approach from the Newtonian uh, gravity and simply write the uh, uh, notice, first of all, that we have the geodesic equation uh, written in uh, our particular coordinate system. Dx alpha over d lambda plus dx beta over d lambda, and this is equal to zero. And after that, substitute that x mu is our fiducial geodesic plus epsilon psi mu plus higher order terms. In that case, we would get uh, d square over d lambda square x not mu plus epsilon. That's basically the standard perturbation theory uh, applied coordinate wise and without all this machinery of differential geometry we have used, we have derived uh, during the last lecture. Uh, it is possible to approach this problem this way. And the problem is that it's rather time consuming and sorry, this should be alpha. And not very enlightening. It's much more interesting and much more important to see, right? Now we could try to figure out what is, the, we could try to gather all terms containing epsilon, derive the equations, the ordinary differential equations for psi from that. And then working with this equation, it is possible in the end to show that this is equivalent to this form. 
but it's far from simple and far from elegant. And there is a better way, which we will do subsequently. So this is a long way. So let's try a more refined geometric approach. That would be the, um, I would call it naive approach. Or approach without, uh, or approach using, co using coordinates. Coordinates. But there's also the geometric approach, which makes use of the properties of the Riemann tensor. And this is the one I want to advertise here. So in order to derive the geodesic division equation, we need one side result. The side result is that, uh, let's call it a lemma. If you're a mathematician, you know what a lemma is. It's a kind of technical solid result, but an important one. The side result is that in the setup, no matter what the geometry is, we have the following. The derivative of xi in the direction t, covariant derivative, is equal to minus the, the derivative of t in the direction of xi. That has to be equal to zero. Mm, yeah. So in this setup, this derivative, uh, no matter what, what kind of function x mu actually is, in the end, what I have written above needs to be true. Uh, this looks a bit mysterious, but you will see that this is in fact a rather simple thing. So this is, in other words, uh, okay, let me go to the proof. We can write it also this way. Um, I'm taking the gradient, the covariant gradient of Xi here. This is a bit of a tricky thing because note that Xi is not defined, T and Xi are not defined over the whole space time. They're just defined within this two dimensional surface formed by this family, but that's okay. That's okay because I'm only differentiating in direction of T and Xi, which are tangent to the surface anyway. So there is no problem here. Uh, okay, let's try to write this equation uh, using the standard derivatives. Uh, alpha, beta, mu, Xi, beta, T, mu minus psi mu d mu d alpha. I'm expressing the covariant derivatives using the Christopher symbols and standard derivatives. Uh, beta mu t beta psi mu. This is supposed to be equal to zero. Uh, now here we've got the contraction with the same vectors, but in different order, but that's not, but that's nothing. Gamma is symmetric in these indices anyway. So this term cancels out with this term. So in the end, we get that this is equal to T mu d mu xi alpha minus uh, xi mu d mu xi, sorry, t alpha. That's an interesting result, which shows that, in fact, we don't need to worry about the uh, gamma coefficients at, at all when we write this particular formula. Uh, they just cancel, cancel each other uh, at the very end. Okay, and now what is this thing here? That's basically the derivative with respect to lambda, because that's t mu d mu, that's derivative with respect to lambda, right? We have an identity here. Mm. Of what is psi mu? Well, psi mu is dx 
alpha over d epsilon. And the other term, that's the derivative with respect to epsilon of the tangent vector coordinates, and that's basically dx alpha over d lambda. And this is zero because uh, the, the partial derivatives always commute. So this thing over here, this just amounts to the statement that the partial derivatives commute. Uh, it's a rather convoluted way of, of writing that, but are the simple lambda commute. Okay. Any questions to this proof? Okay, I don't see any. Uh, let me just know, since this object has appeared, in general, this for, for any two vectors, for any two vector fields. Y beta. This particular combination, nabla x, y, alpha minus nabla y, x, alpha, which we can also calculate using the standard derivatives instead of the covariant ones. We have noticed this already. Uh, this is a vector, obviously, because this thing here is a vector. It's less obvious from this equation that the resulting thing will be a vector, but it is because it's equal to that one. Well, this is known as the commutator of, this, of these two vector fields and plays an important role in differential geometry. So if you have two vector fields, you can generate a third one by applying this rule over here. An interesting side note is that we use here the covariant derivative of a metric G. But if we change the metric, nothing really changes. The, the, it doesn't matter which covariant derivative we use, we will always get the same result, uh, provided that the uh, connection is torsion free. Uh, so if you ever encounter the commutator of two vector fields in a general relativity or, or differential equations or differential geometry uh, paper, this is what, what they're talking about. So we have shown that the commutator T psi has to be equal to zero in this setup. Okay. Uh, once we have established that, so we know that nabla T psi alpha minus nabla psi T alpha is zero. And we also know that nabla T the alpha is, is zero. Uh, so let's let's now differentiate the first equation with respect to t, and make use of the uh, of the condition for for the geodesics to be uh, for the curves to be geodesics as well. So we obtain. nabla t, nabla t psi alpha minus. Here we differentiate what is effectively psi beta nabla beta alpha. Here the derivative can either uh, attack this one or that one. So from the product rule for differentiations, we get but this is nabla t, nabla t psi alpha minus nabla t psi beta minus t, let's say gamma psi beta, nabla gamma, nabla beta t alpha. Okay. We leave the first equation as it is, the first term as it is. Uh, we also leave the first, the second term as it is. But in the second, in this term, we can 
change the order of differentiation because here we first uh, take the derivative with respect to psi and only after that with respect to t and we would like to change that because the derivative of t with respect to t is zero so we might be able to use our geodesic condi condition so we write that this is gamma psi beta nabla beta nabla gamma the alpha but the penalty for changing the order of differentiation is the emergence of the uh, curvature term which in this case will be uh, gamma beta let's say sigma and we got p sigma okay and that's nabla t nabla t psi alpha Oh, sorry. This is here multiplied by nabla beta t alpha. I have forgotten about one term. It comes from the differentiation of by by covariant differentiation with respect to t of psi times this thing over here. So there's this term missing here and also here. Okay, so here we got psi beta t gamma nabla beta nabla gamma t alpha minus r alpha sigma gamma beta and let's try to keep the right order of t sigma t gamma and psi beta. Uh, we are pretty close. Uh, and now we can, uh, now we have the second covariant derivative contracted with two vectors, but we can write it also as the derivative with respect to psi of t gamma, nabla gamma t alpha. But again, we have, we have to also notice that in this case, we also obtain the term in which we d differentiate t and contract with this thing here. Uh, and we need to get rid of this term. And after that, we got R alpha sigma gamma beta, T sigma T gamma psi beta. Okay, from the geodesic condition, we know that this thing over here that's zero because we're talking about geodesics. And here I have forgotten a bunch of terms. Okay, we are just one step away from our formula. Um, and what we get is here's nabla t psi beta, nabla beta t alpha. Then I write this term here, which is nabla psi t. I will change this letter here to beta, the summation index, nabla beta t alpha. And then we've got the curvature term. That's equal to zero. Let's go to the next blackboard. But before that, let's think a, a little bit about this thing over here. Uh, we have the same gradient of, of T term over here. So we can also write this down in the following way.
uh, zero is equal to now blood t, now blood t psi alpha plus nabla minus nabla t psi beta plus nabla psi t beta nabla beta what's here t alpha minus r alpha let's write it this way beta gamma delta t beta gamma psi delta but we have proved uh, not so long ago that this is the commutator which vanishes in this case so in the end the equation takes the form of nabla t nabla t psi alpha minus r alpha beta gamma delta T beta T gamma psi delta that's zero. Yeah. Any questions to this proof? Uh, we have basically differentiated this commutation relation between T and psi with respect to T. Then we applied a little bit of tensor algebra plus the identity uh, for exchanging the order of covariant differentiation over here then a bit more tensor algebra and we notice that something simplifies because of the geodesic condition over here and then we did a bit more of tensor algebra just to discover that two terms cancel each other out again because of the commutation relation and that's what results Okay. Uh, it's possible to write down this equation uh, step by step in, in a particular coordinate system. So in that case, it takes the form of psi alpha double dot. This is the differ differentiation with respect to lambda along our functional geodesic here. Uh, gamma mu kappa alpha rho psi kappa so in a general coordinate system this is what it looks like but that's not the most convenient way to look at this problem and the most convenient would be to do one more step so let's go back to our fiducial null geodesic gamma naught uh, we can introduce uh, a tetrad, a, a basis of the tangent space consisting of the vector T mu plus some free sp spatial vectors E i alpha. And then we can parallel transport this thing uh, all along our fiducial geodesic. That's the parallel transport of this frame over here. So we pick it, uh, we pick a frame at one particular point, but we can, uh, but this point, uh, this frame can be transported all along this curve. The physical interpretation is that, well, T is T, it gives the for velocity or the, the frame of, of reference of our our central observer but we also define the constant directions on the sky of this observer as given for example by a set of gyroscopes and that's given by these three spatial vectors psi normalized and orthogonal to t and if we use this uh, we can decompose psi alpha as yeah so, so so let's call it f alpha mu this is the index of the 
basis T E I. Uh, let me go back to the standard color. So this is parallel transported. So we know that number T of each of these vectors is zero by definition everywhere. Uh, this is parallel transport. And now uh, we can decompose psi mu in this tetrad. So psi mu will be psi alpha f alpha mu. Uh, the covariant derivative of psi along this vector, this psi will be, well, nabla t psi alpha, which is just e psi alpha over d lambda plus psi alpha, the covariant derivative of f alpha along the curve, which is conveniently zero. So if we decompose our deviation vector psi in this frame, the standard derivative becomes equal, identical to the covariant one. And that's very nice because this means that the geodesic division equation takes a very nice form. D squared psi alpha over D lambda square minus R alpha beta mu mu the alpha T mu this thing psi mu that's zero. So we don't have some additional ugly gamma derivatives appearing anywhere here. And that's nice. Uh, uh, of course, if, we, if we're dealing with a time-like curve, uh, we can take T alpha to be simply the four velocity of, of our uh, observer. And lambda in, in this case is simply equal to the uh, proper time along as measured by, by, by the central observer. Uh, yeah, and in this case, things get even simpler. We can write everything down in the following way. So now our frame is u alpha e i alpha. This corresponds to the zero f zero. This corresponds to f i. Uh, we've got d psi alpha over d lambda. The goal of the, these maneuvers is to make the resulting equation as similar to the Newtonian counterpart as possible. Uh, it's already fairly similar, but not identical. Uh, u beta u mu psi mu, well, that's zero. Okay. But this is nothing else since u is the zero uh, is f zero. This is just the zero zero component of the Riemann tensor psi u. Okay, this is almost like the uh, equation for for tidal forces in Newtonian gravity, except that psi has four dimensions. It 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 has the component zero plus three spatial ones. But the equation for the zero component is kind of simple. You can simply see that uh, for the equation for zero, we, we got the zero zero component of the Riemann tensor, which is by definition zero. So the equation for this guy is just d lambda square of this is equal to zero. So this is a linear function. Uh, sorry, one more thing. We are now using not just a 
and the uh, we're not using any random uh, affine parameter. We are using the proper time of the observer. So this is tau. So from this, we see that psi zero is a linear function, some a tau plus b. However, let's think what this, uh, what this actually means. Uh, let's go back to our previous, this one. No, I want to go through this one. Yeah, psi zero simply corresponds to the, uh, if you look carefully, psi zero simply corresponds to the little tilt of this vector psi. It simply means that when you look at two neighboring geodesics over here, uh, then the constant tau, uh, the constant tau, uh, curves are not orthogonal to the geodesics. This simply means that the uh, clocks each of the of these observers are using they're not properly synchronized. We can always opt to synchronize them without changing the geodesics themselves in such a way that at some initial point this psi over here is orthogonal to t. That's a gauge choice. Meaning it's a choice of choosing appropriate parametrizations of each of these geodesics. One in which two very close geodesics are, the clocks on two geodesics nearby are properly synchronized. Um, in the frame, reference frame of, of let's say this Tibusona geodesic, the neighboring one uh, has a clock which runs exactly at the same rate, but also uh, it gives the same indication uh, in the same moment. We can impose this condition. That's just simply means that psi zero is equal to zero and d psi zero over d tau is equal to zero initially. And if we impose that, let's go back to this layer. We can impose the condition psi zero equal to zero at all times. Then we are just left with three spatial equations, which are, by the way, entirely decoupled from this psi zero. J, psi, J. The psi zero term, well, first of all, it decouples because it, it could only appear here from, from the, from the uh, Riemann zero zero component, which is zero, but also, uh, well, we can set it to zero by appropriate choice of parametrizations of geodesics. So in the end, even though this equation appears at first glance as an equation for four components, the equation for one component is kind of geometrically irrelevant uh, and very easy to solve. And we can set this component to zero. Effectively, only three spatial components matter. And the equation for this, these three components is exactly analogous to the tidal equation in uh, Newtonian physics, provided that we identify the appropriate components of the Riemann tensor with the tidal tensor from Newtonian physics. Uh, do you have any questions to this derivation? I don't hear any, so I think it's a good time for a break. Let me share the screen I show during the break. It's 9.57, so we will be back at 10.07 a.m. So it's time for a break. Hello, everyone. So it's already seven minutes past 10. It's time for the next part of this course. So now uh, we are going back to our slides. Okay, here they are. Yes, so we have shown that uh, you can derive the geodesic deviation equation for the vector psi. And this has a physical interpretation of, uh, this equation has the physical interpretation of governing the local tidal forces for uh, a particular observer. 
when you have another observer which is located slightly off uh, and maybe even initially at rest, in general, uh, there will be an acceleration between them and one of them would begin to drift away or towards the, uh, the observer, depending on the properties of the Riemann tensor. Okay, now it's time for the next big topic, the Einstein equations. So we are almost done with discussing special uh, general relativity. There's one piece which is missing. So we have already found out that the space-time is a manifold, four-dimensional manifold with the Lorentzian metric, G. Uh, we know that this metric G defines a particular connection, which in turn defines locally flat uh, inertial systems. Just a second, I will switch on the pointer. Uh, the metric connection that defines locally flat coordinates and the same way it defines local inertial frames in which the physics takes a particularly simple form in which basically we can use special relativity intuitions. Then all physical laws in this initial frames takes their special relativity form and in particular the free-falling particles uh, follow geodesics so curves which appear straight in the local inertial coordinates uh, around each point. The massive particles correspond to time-like geodesics, massless particles or light rays correspond to null geodesics. Something is still missing and the missing part is where do we actually take the metric from? Uh, the idea is that since the space-time geometry somehow influences the behavior of matter, the matter should influence the, the, the geometry of the space-time. But how exactly? Now, you cannot really derive the Einstein equations from something more fundamental. What you can do is to provide, what you can do is provide some kind of simple heuristics uh, why the Einstein equations, the equations, field equations for relativity, general relativity should look more or less like that. Uh, what is really important are observational tests of relativity, which tell you which equations are, are, are the correct ones or the ones which, uh, which reproduce the experiment best. It turns out that the simplest equations with one small modification are the best we have right now. Okay, so in order to uh, in order to derive the uh, or provide justification for the field equations in relativity, uh, we will go back to the Newtonian theory, where the field equations is just the Poisson equation on the one single scalar potential. Uh, on the right hand side, we've got the matter density. Now, what is the GR counterpart of that? In particular, what is the counterpart of the potential uh, of the Laplace operator and the matter density? So when, when we look at the equations of motions in Newtonian theory, we see that basically uh, the motion, the spatial motion of a particle, the acceleration is given by the derivative of the potential phi. If you look at the corresponding equation in GR, we see that on the right-hand side, we basically have the gamma coefficient, the, the, the connection coefficient time x dot x dot. And the gamma coefficient contains the derivative of the metric. So it seems reasonable to assume that phi, the gravitational potential and the metric should be in a sense counterparts. So we are looking for an equation for the metric. Uh, then, uh, the Laplace operator applied to phi, as, as, as it appears in the Poisson equation, that's basically the second derivative of phi uh, contracted with the metric tensor of, of a three space, which is delta ij in standard coordinates. So basically, what we are looking is what we are looking at is a differential operator of the second order, one involving the second derivatives of the metric uh, of phi. Now we are looking for, for its counterpart in GR. It should contain the second derivatives of the metric tensor. And an obvious candidate would be the Riemann's curvature. It's a tensorial quantity and contains the second derivatives of G. Uh, now regarding the sources. Uh, in Newtonian theory, it's just the uh, matter density rho. Uh, in general relativity, rho is not by itself a well-defined quantity, a, a covariant quantity. It's just a part of a larger thing this larger thing being the stress energy tensor. It's basically the zero zero component 
in a particular frame. So it's reasonable to assume that it should be the stress energy tensor, the whole tensor, uh, which should act as the source of the gravitational field. So we need field equations for the metric G mu nu as a, as a field. We don't treat it as a stationary background as in special relativity, it's a field with its own dynamics. And should couple to matter, uh, preferably via the curvature tensor, and should couple to the stress energy tensor of the matter. We know that the stress energy tensor is not arbitrary, it's a symmetric uh, quantity, and it's also conserved in the sense that uh, we've got the local conservation law. In special relativity, it's just the standard derivative, which is uh, the standard divergence, which is equal to zero. We promote it to the covariant divergence in general relativity. So the first guess, we need a counterpart of, of, of this tensor made of curvature, and the, the, of the first choice would be to take the Ricci tensor, which is also symmetric. Uh, it has the same number of indices, so we may impose that Ricci is proportional to T. And this is what Einstein, in fact, proposed first. But there is a bit of a problem with this form. And the problem is when appears when we calculate the divergence of these equations. So on the right-hand side, we get zero because of the uh, energy and momentum conservation. Uh, on the other hand, we've got the Bianchi identities for the Ricci tensor. They basically tell us, in this case, that the derivative of the Ricci scalar is zero which means that the Ricci scalar must be constant. And that's a pretty strong restriction of all admissible geometries. If we were to admit equations of this kind, it would mean that a rather special type of um, matrix is only allowed in, in our gravitational theories, these for which Ricci is constant. And this quickly uh, appeared to be too restrictive to Einstein especially since there is a very simple way to avoid this problem. So how about taking a combination of the Ricci uh, tensor and Ricci scalar instead, in particular this combination over here. This is called the Einstein tensor. Uh, you can check that the Bianchi identities applied to this tensor simply mean that the divergence of this, this Einstein tensor, which is divergence of that, this is equal to zero. And now things just seem to fit very well. If we assume that the Einstein tensor is proportional to the stress energy tensor, then uh, from these equations, it follows automatically that the stress energy tensor must be conserved. So this type of local energy and momentum conservation on, on, on small scales in every local inertia frame is in a sense built into the theory of gravitation. You cannot solve the equations without that. This is a little bit like in the Maxwell's theory, where the local charge conservation, charge and current conservation is built into the theory. Uh, if we just assume this set of Maxwell equations to be valid and have to be anti-symmetric, then the divergence of J must be zero by definition. There is no place for any kind of non-conservation here. On the other hand, so, so we have restricted our possible sources to those for which uh, mass and uh, energy and momentum are conserved. On the other hand, at the same time, we have uh, we managed to get rid of the restriction of on the space-time geometry. Because look, now if we use G mu uh, as our as our uh, on the left-hand side of the equations, whatever geometry we we, we pick, uh, the resulting Einstein tensor always has to needs to have a vanishing divergence. So the, the fact that T mu nu is conserved, that our source, source conserves energy and momentum, does not impose any additional restrictions on the geometry of the spacetime, except that the field equations need to be valid. But that's not, not a big deal. That's what we expect. So no additional constraints on geometry except the field equations. Uh, the consistency with the previous theory of gravitation, with the Newtonian theory, fixes the value of the constant kappa. Uh, we will, in fact, make an, the appropriate calculation on the blackboard at some point in the future, maybe even today. So the Einstein equations, uh, Einstein postulate to have the form of r mu nu minus one half r g upper mu nu, that's eight pi g, the stress energy tensor. 
And these are one of, this is one of most important formulas of this lecture. So something to remember. Uh, now a few remarks to the Einstein equations. Oh, or maybe before that, do you have questions to the uh, heuristics and to the derivation of the Einstein equations so far? Okay, I don't see any. So now let's talk a little bit about the equations themselves. So we have been working in a, a system of units in which the speed of light is equal to one, just, just for convenience. But if we drop this assumption, if we work in the standard SI system, in the standard system of physical measurements, then uh, we have to include c in the power of four in the denominator here. So very often you will find the Einstein equations appearing in this form. Uh, in fact, assuming that the coordinates in the space-time itself, note that uh, we are free to choose our coordinates here, and we're also free to choose the units in which we measure our coordinates. But the simplest practice, the simplest idea would be to use coordinates which are uh, which have the units of meter. In that case, the metric tensor, both lower and upper index is dimensionless, which makes the curvature tensor, uh, the rigid tensor and the rigid scalar to be of the order of M to minus two. That's because they are made of, they're, they're made of the uh, derivatives of the components of the metric, which are dimensionless, but derivatives cost you one over meter. So the second derivative cost you one over meter squared. On the right hand side, the stress energy tensor is has the dimension of joule over meter to the power of three is the density of energy. And this type of, uh, this constant over here, eight pi j over c, c to the power four, it has the dimension of written over here. And you can check yourself that now things work very well. On the other hand, instead of writing explicitly uh, all physical constants in these equations, we can do something opposite. We can change the our, our system of units to completely geometric one. So instead of just using our new measurement of time equals to C times the old time, so measuring time in meters, we can also measure the masses and in meters. Uh, so we define our new mass to be g m old over c squared. This has the dimensionality of a meter. And in this system of units, the nice thing is that both g and c are equal to one. So the Einstein equations take a form without any kind of uh, physical constants whatsoever. In more mathematically oriented literature, this is I think the most common form of the Einstein equations with no g over here at all. Okay, there is one small trick we can play with these equations. Uh, we can take the trace of this equation over here, so multiply by the metric with lower indices mu nu. And what we get from that is that minus the Ricci scalar is equal to eight pi g, the trace of t. Now we can take this r term and move it to the other side and substitute r with, with, the, with t, and we get a slightly different form of the Einstein equations, but equally valid, that the Ricci tensor is equal to a pi g t mu nu minus half trace of t g mu nu. And that's just an alternative form of the Einstein equations people sometimes use. And in particular, in vacuum, when you have no matter whatsoever, well, you can write these equations simply that the Einstein tensor is equal to zero, but you can equally well simply write that the Ricci tensor is zero. These two statements are entirely equivalent. So again, more mathematically oriented people call the vacuum Einstein equations, the equations that the Ricci tensor is equal to zero. And that's perfectly equivalent to this thing here. From mathematician's perspective, the Einstein equations are a bit of a complicated system of coupled partial differential equations for the components of the metric tensor. Uh, 
if you work a little bit harder on, on their form, you can recast them in a special way as a sort of called quasi-linear hyperbolic system. Uh, Quasi-linear simply means that the uh, leading order, uh, uh, the, 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 the terms with higher highest derivatives have a particular form. Uh, it's quasi-hyperbolic means that, well, it means that roughly it behaves more or less like the wave equations, but not quite. The, on the positive side, it turned out to be true that these equations have a well-defined initial value problem. Uh, what I mean here is that if you specify the initial conditions, so this, this, this space-time geometry uh, at some instant of time t0, if these, con if these initial conditions satisfy certain additional requirements, I will not talk much, uh, will not talk much in this lecture, uh, you can find a unique development of this, uh, of this data into the future. This is obvious for ordinary differential equations where we have uh, the whole theory of, of uh, uniqueness and, and, and solutions of, of equations. But for partial differential equations, this is far from obvious. It was only in the 1950s when Yvonne choquet managed to prove the first result that for vacuum Einstein equations, there exists a unique development. And unique here does not mean a unique set of functions g mu nu. In fact, there will be infinitely many possible uh, solutions. However, they will be related to, they will describe the same geometry just at, just at a different, uh, using a different coordinate system. So this is a rather complicated result. Uh, Yvonne Choquet, who I was, uh, is, 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 was at that time uh, probably the leading female uh, mathematical physicist of, of, of her time. She's, she's, I think, around 90 now. Mm. Another peculiar feature of the Einstein equations is that, is that they are covariant, meaning that their form is identical in any coordinate system with peak. So let's have a look again at the Poisson equation, equations. The most convenient, the, the, the most common form for these equations is in Cartesian coordinates, where this is just the sum of second derivatives, which is equal to four g rho. But in physics, it's sometimes useful to write it, for example, in cylindrical coordinates. And it's obvious that the left-hand side, this Laplacian phi, has a different functional form, depending on the type of coordinate systems you use. And this is not true for the Einstein equations, or more precisely, for the Einstein equations plus the definition of the Riemann plus the definition of the uh, gamma coefficients, the uh, Levi-Civita connection. All of these equations have exactly and precisely the same uh, functional form in any coordinate system we pick. There's just no, no difference whatsoever. Uh, this does not mean that uh, the equations, it's equally easy to solve the equations in any coordinate system would pick. Uh, in fact, in general relativity, the same way, general relativity behave, in general relativity coordinate systems are used exactly in the same way as in other branches of physics. Typically, you adapt your coordinate system to your un underlying physics, either to the matter fields, or if there are no matter fields, you might try to recast your metric, in, to put your metric in a special form by a clever choice of coordinates. This way you simplify the problem in the sense that, for example, some terms uh, in, in these complications, complicated expressions are uh, disappear and you have to deal with fewer functions. However, formally, the equations always look the same in any coordinate system. Uh, or to say it differently, uh, the Einstein equations themselves do not distinguish between uh, curvilinear coordinate systems or Cartesian coordinate systems or any other coordinate systems. Uh, have you got any questions? Okay, I don't hear any. Uh, and then we have another topic, the cosmological constant. Uh, cosmological constant is another term people uh, often include in the Einstein equations. 
which consists simply of lambda, a, a constant number times the metric G. So we add this type of term on the right-hand side. Uh, this term was first proposed by Einstein in 1917, simply because he did not like the idea that, uh, he quickly discovered that these equations do not allow for a static universe with matter. The universe has to expand or contract, or the, so it has to have some kind of long-term dynamics. So in order to allow for a static solution, which we considered more, more, at that time, people did not have that many cosmological observations. So it seemed logical for him to assume that uh, the universe should not expand or contract. Uh, it should be static. In order to allow for a static solution, he introduced this type of term with a constant. Uh, but later it was discovered that indeed the universe appears to be expanding in the 1920s and 30s, and this term was dropped. Most of literature from that from later time does not include the cosmological constant. Uh, but later in late 1990s, early 2000s, it was discovered that the expansion of the universe has been accelerating recently. So uh, we obtain increasing amount of evidence that not only the, the, the universe is, is expanding, but also that the speed of the expansion is slightly increasing, or at least started to increase quite recently. Uh, the main discovery was the, uh, so the discovery happened when people started investigating the uh, extremely distant supernovae. Uh, supernovae are basically ex exploding stars, um, stars ending their life with powerful explosions. A certain type of high supernova has very nice physical properties which allow to measure their absolute luminosity or predict their absolute luminosity. We can then compare our prediction of the luminosity uh, based on the distance from the, from the supernova uh, from what we actually observe. And it turned out that the uh, observations are difficult to reconcile with the Einstein equations unless we add a small cosmological constant. Uh, in fact, this work was awarded with Nobel Prize in 2011 uh, to Saul Permuter, uh, Schmidt, and Adam Ries. Uh, I include here the relevant plots from their papers. So they were observing explosions of distant supernovae. Uh, the plot, in the plot, you see the magnitude, which is pretty much, uh, uh, for non-astronomers, it's a measurement of how bright these explosions appear. And on the x-axis, you, you see the redshift, which is a measure of distance from, uh, from that explosion. And what is relevant is the upper part of both of these curves. The lower part measures the, the uh, expansion rate, current expansion rate of the universe, but the upper part, it appears to be, let's say, it appears to be uh, bending slightly upwards. This bending upwards is impossible to, it's, it's difficult to fit this data without assuming some kind of cosmological constant. What is written here is omega lambda, which is something proportional to the cosmological constant, but not the constant itself. It's, it's a common uh, parameterization in cosmology. We'll not get, we'll not talk much about this in, in this course, but omega lambda is something proportional to lambda and it seems that the best fit requires some kind of non-vanishing lambda in both papers, exactly because these supernova here appear dimmer than they would, uh, assuming that there was no lambda. Uh, there are two important things to realize regarding uh, the cosmological constant. First of all, it must be a constant. We, it cannot vary with the position or with time. It's easy to see it. If you take the, uh, if you take the divergence of these equations, so we take the nabla mu divergence of the left-hand side and of the right-hand side, the divergence of the right-hand side vanishes because of the conservation of the energy momentum tensor. On the left-hand side, this thing vanishes because of the Bianchi identities. So we are just left with the derivative of lambda and also must be zero. So lambda is just fixed once and for all for our universe. The current value we need is of the order of 10 to minus 52 
one over meter squared. And that's a very small number. It becomes relevant only on cosmological scales. So unless you're dealing with the universe as a whole or distances, uh, largest possible distances in our universe, you don't need to worry about lambda all that much. Uh, and in particular, when you consider simply stellar physics or the physics of a galaxy, this time can be very safely, can be safely neglected. So still a lot of people work with Einstein equations without lambda and that's justified. However, there's an, an interesting point. Positive value of lambda means that gravity can act effectively act as a repulsive force on extremely large distances. That's a bit counterintuitive in the uh, in the scales of the solar system or galaxy. Gravity is always an attractive force, but it turns out that on very large distances there is a, there is something repulsive about about it. If you write the Einstein equations with cosmological constant in this form over here, lambda is a bit like the modification of the left-hand side of the equations, but we can easily uh, move it to the other side of the equations, and then it becomes something like an additional source. And in fact, this additional source term uh, can be considered a very special type of fluid. So this is, it does not look, look so at first sight, but when you look carefully, this is pretty much like a fluid for which the pressure is exactly equal to minus the density, at least when C is equal to one. Uh, in this case, the energy density of this fluid is, is, is very small. It's 10 to minus 10 joule to minus squared. Or if you convert it to mass density, it's also a very small number. OK, any questions to the cosmological constant? OK, I don't hear any. So the next topic will be the variation principle for the Einstein equations. So very often, uh, so, so many physical laws in mechanics, but also uh, the, the Maxwell equations in electromagnetic theory can be formed as a variation principle, a principle of stationary action. We define uh, a functional of, of, of the fields, which has the form of an integral of a Lagrangian over either time or, or the whole space time. It depends on the fields and their derivatives or on the motions. And the idea is that the physical laws uh, can be recovered from the following principle. The physical fields are the fields for which this, this action is stationary with respect to small perturbations. If we slightly perturb our um, our fields phi uh, and the fields are in a physical state, uh, they follow the equations of motion or the field equations, then at the leading order, this, this delta L is stationary. Plus possibly some boundary terms, but typically in these variational principles, we assume that the boundary values of our fields and the boundary values, boundary positions, um, of our particles are fixed. So if we if we assume that delta S phi is equal to zero, that should give us the field equations for phi. Uh, it turns out it's also possible for, for the Einstein field equations in general relativity, and in fact, in more than one way. It was already David Hilbert, a renowned German mathematician, one of the leading mathematicians of that era, in 1915, uh, pointed out to Einstein that his equations follow from a relatively simple uh, variational principle. Uh, formulating uh, formulating the uh, Einstein equations in terms of uh, a variational principle has a couple of advantages. Uh, this is, for example, useful uh, for the definition of total energy, mass, and angular momentum. Uh, it turns out that by manipulating the definition of phi, you can, you can you can define these these quantities. We'll not do it in this lecture, but it's it's an interesting point. It's also useful from the point of view of uh, something called the three plus one decomposition of the Einstein equations used in numerical relativity. So when you want to solve the Einstein equations on a computer, and 
quite often you have no other choice. What you need to do is to uh, split your space time into a space and time. Assume you've got some data regarding the, the, the geometry of, of, of one of these constant time slices, the space, and then recast your, uh, the Einstein equations as evolution equation, equations for the geometry of, uh, of, this, of this spatial uh, slice. This is a bit, uh, this is a rather complicated thing. Uh, it can be done using something called the ADM formalism, uh, using numerical relativity. And the simplest way to recast the Einstein equations in this three plus one way, so method in which time and space are uh, split, uh, is to use the uh, appropriate variational principle. Another reason why people like variational principles for, for Einstein equations is that it's also relatively easy to introduce the modification of the uh, Einstein equations. So for many reasons, you might be not very happy with the equations as they are right now, because you want to have some kind of alternative uh, gravity theory, uh, either because you think that some cosmological other observations are slightly easier to, to um, explain when you slightly modify GR, or just you need some kind of uh, alternative to test GR against. And the simplest method to introduce these modifications is to modify the Lagrangian of, 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 the, of general relativity. And also there is a group of, of theoretical physicists who work on quantizing gravity, making gravity also a quantum theory. There has been some progress in this area, but this is far from being solved. However, most of these attempts make one way or another use of, the, of a variational principle leading to Einstein equations. Okay, so how, how can we guess the variational principle for Einstein equations? Well, the first point, the first thing we need to notice is that uh, the Einstein equations don't, are completely invariant with respect to coordinate system. So we should expect the variation to the, the, the action to be also coordinate system invariant. We should not notice what kind of coordinate system we use to perform the integration. And in order to make to, to make things so, we do the following. We take we will use the letter G for the determinant of the metric G mu nu with lower indices. And we take our action to be an integral of our Lagrangian times the square root of minus G times uh, D4x as our, our measure for the integration. Uh, why do we do it? Well, think what happens when we change the coordinates system from x mu to some kind of y mu. In that case, uh, in the integration, we have to include the, Jaco the determinant of the Jacobian, uh, or more precisely, its absolute value uh, when changing the, the coordinates and not changing the integration coordinates. On the other hand, the metric will also transform according to the standard tensorial rule. And this means that this G, this determinant will uh, transform according to the rule over here. So it will be multiplied by the square of the determinant of the uh, Jacobian. And that's very nice because you see, assuming that this thing here is a scalar, so the Lagrangian itself is, is a scalar, this thing integrated over uh, the coordinate system x, that's, if we change the coordinates, you have to include the, the Jacobian here. On the other hand, you'd also like to express g using g prime because we, uh, the one evaluated in our new coordinates. And it turns out that these two, these two uh, laws of, uh, these two transformation laws work together very well. And in the end, you find out that this is equal exactly to the integral of the same LG with the same uh, factor here, but this time expressed in the coordinates y. This works because the scalar L, the, like the, Lagrangian, the Lagrangian L as a scalar, multiplied by the square root of minus g, this becomes a, a different type of quantity. It's not a scalar anymore. It's something called a scalar density. It's a quantity which under the coordinate transformations 
transforms simply by the multiplication by an appropriate power of the determinant of the Jacobian lambda. Multiplying a scalar by this, this type of thing, this type of square of the term, square root of determinant changes this thing into a scalar density. And scalar density are exactly the type of quantities you, you, you very much like to integrate over, over a four dimensional volume. Because in this case, the integral is coordinate invariant. Otherwise, if we took a scalar here, the precise value of this integral would depend on the coordinate system we choose. But we would prefer our variational principle to be coordinate system invariant because we want to get coordinate system invariant equations in the end. Uh, I decided not to derive the, not to show you deriva the derivation precisely step by step because it's a bit complicated and not that enlightening. However, I will show you the variational principle itself. So the original Hilbert variation prin principle is the following. We need a scalar Lagrangian, Lagrangian function, which is a function of the metric and possibly its derivatives. And it needs to be a proper scalar. What's the simplest thing we can use here? And then a trivial one. Well, the simplest thing is probably the Ricci scalar, which is in the end a function of the metric, its first derivative via gammas and second derivatives via the derivative of gammas. And it works. If you take the action to be the sum of the action of the uh, of the gravitational field, which is the integral of the Ricci scalar times a prefactor, you take some kind of matter Lagrangian, depending on the matter degrees of freedom or, or fields, whatever they are. Uh, again, in order to make everything invariant, I assume that the integration is performed over the square root of minus g times d four x. If we vary this thing with respect to the metric, it turns out after a rather lengthy calculations that up to the boundary terms, what appears here is simply the Einstein tensor times the variation of the upper index g. And what we see here is the variation of L with respect to the upper index g. Note that the Lagrangian density usually involves the metric in its definition. So this is non-zero. Uh, we call this thing here minus half of the effective stress energy tensor times minus square root of minus g. And in that case, you recover the Einstein equations by demanding this to be zero. Uh, here, the calculations are a little bit difficult. Uh, just a few years later, Palatini found a, a, an even simpler and, 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 in a sense, more elegant approach in which you, you take a variation principle which formally looks the same. You, you still have the Ricci tensor times minus g, but you consider the Ricci tensor a function of the uh, separately of the connection coefficients and their derivatives and the metric. And you treat the connection and the metric as completely separate entities, two different fields. You vary with respect to both of them. However, what you recover in the end is the same thing. You recover from varying with respect to the uh, gamma coefficients, you recover equations that uh, the connection must be the Palatini connection, must be the levi chimta connection of this metric. And from the, the variation with respect to the metric, you recover then the Einstein equations. So the res end result is the same. Mm. I will not present the details of the derivation. If you are curious, the Palatini's principle is nicely described in, in the Misner Ton Wheeler in the, in the 21st chapter. The Hilbert's principle, uh, the nicest derivation I have seen is in Sean Carroll's textbook, Space Time and Geometry, in chapter four. When you look at the variational principle as defined by these two Lagrangian, Lagrangians, it's easy to see what kind of modifications we make at this level. Instead of taking the Ricci scale, the bare Ricci scalar, we can take a function of the Ricci scalar, whatever function we, we, we fancy. Uh, this will modify the resulting equations. Is, these are called the F of R theories. We can add terms with higher derivatives of the curvature or, um, or higher powers of the curvature. We could, in principle, add additional fields, scalar, vector, or tensor. Uh, for example, the oldest alternative gravity theory called the Brown-Sticky theory just 
assumes that there's an additional scalar field over here together with the metric. Or we can add more dimensions, assume that the integral also has to be taken over small invisible dimensions. And there is many more types of modifications you can you can try here. And they're all done at the level of the Lagrangian. After that, you have to derive your, your field equations, your equations for matter, derive the effective metric, the, the, the matrices, derive the equations for the metric tensor, the, the, the field equations, and then think about the observational consequences of your theory. You have to uh, you have to account for all the observations we had about gravity, including the fact that the gravitational waves propagate at the speed of light, that um, within the scales of our solar system, system your, the theory has to um, behave exactly like GR, uh, and so on and so on. Okay, have you got any questions? Okay, I don't see any. So we have 10 more minutes. We can go to the next topic, which is linearized Einstein equations. So now we have completed the, um, the course, the, the introduction to GR in the sense that we, we have all the ingredients of GR in place, the field equations, uh, the metric and its role. Now it's time to look for some kind of solutions and and think about the physical implications of, of our new theory of relativity. Uh, we will consider first the following problem. So assume that in our space time, we have a coordinate system x mu in which the metric is can be written as the sum of a constant metric uh, eta mu nu, the one with, with plus and minus, minus one, plus one, plus one, plus one in the diagonal. We'll call it the flat background plus an additional h mu nu, which we assume to be very small. We'll call it the perturbation. And we'll assume h mu nu to be much smaller than one. And we'll also assume that its derivative is much smaller than one. So we can, we can safely perform linearization and just keep the leading order linear terms in h uh, during the calculations. And the motivation for this is very simple. Uh, the space-time appears to be pretty much flat over very large regions of the space-time. In fact, when you look at our galaxy, or in fact, uh, the, the whole local group uh, near our galaxy, the space-time there appears to be almost flat over these huge regions of space-time. In fact, it's very, far from, it's, it's very far from flat only in very special places uh, in the immediate vicinity of massive compact objects such as black holes, neutron stars, uh, supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies. But these are relatively small, well-defined regions. Everywhere else, the metric is almost flat, which means that this approximation is likely to work very well. But if it is so, then one of the most important tools in, the, in a theoretical physicist's toolbox is the perturbation theory, where you have a known solution, the flat space-time, and you want, and you try to approximate the physical one by uh, adding a small perturbation to your known solution. So this looks like a promising approach to solve complicated nonlinear set of equations. So the Einstein equations are nonlinear, rather difficult to solve, but perturbation theory will make them linear and much simpler, much more tractable. Uh, in this approach, we obtain linear partial differential equations equations. This is very nice. These equations are simpler to solve, but also simpler to understand. The physics of the uh, Einstein equations, uh, it's, it's pretty difficult to understand its physics in the raw form, but in the linear form, this is much, much easier. And another point is that we have to understand the linear theory in order to make a connection with Newtonian gravity and show that all this game we have been playing makes, makes any sense whatsoever. We have to prove that the internal theory is contained in, in GR as an appropriate limit. 
and this is done most conveniently via linearization. On top of that, the propagation of gravitational waves over large distances, this is something that is best described uh, when you consider the linearized equations. So there's a lot of incentives uh, uh, why we might be interested in this type of approach. Uh, we will do it on the blackboard, but before we do it, there's a couple of things which I need to state. What we will do is very much a coordinate dependent construction. So the equations we will derive are not proper tensorial equations. They're supposed to be valid not in every coordinate systems, but rather in that coordinate system X mu in which you can perform this decomposition. Secondly, this flat space time metric, in our calculations, we'll use it as a kind of substitute for the full metric. We'll use it to raise indices, lower indices, and so on. But this is, you have to always keep in mind that this eta is just a useful mathematical tool. It's not the physical metric. The physical metric is the whole G, which includes age. Uh, so eta mu nu doesn't exist. In a sense, it's a ghost, but a very useful one. Uh, we will neglect all quadratic terms in H, which also includes H times the derivative of H or two derivatives of H. Uh, this decomposition, we assume that this decomposition works on a large uh, region in a particular coordinate systems, but we'll also see that this X mu is not unique. You can still tweak your coordinate system a little bit. And this is a very good thing. It will simplify our life a little bit. And our first goal would be to impose the Einstein equations on H mu nu here and find the simplest possible form of the resulting equations. Uh, do you have any questions to linearization? I don't see any, so let's go to the blackboard for the last five minutes. Linearizing Einstein's equations. Let me open my notes. Okay, so we assume that G mu nu is eta mu nu plus H mu nu. This is small. Uh, now I will begin by deriving the inverse metric. So uh, if age is not pre present, then the inverse metric should be simply the inverse eta metric, which is eta itself, by the way. But at the linear level, there will be some kind of additional term. It's proportional to age. And I would like to see what this term is. We know that the metric times the inverse metric has to be delta alpha mu. So just substituting it over here. eta alpha nu plus y alpha nu. That's supposed to be alpha nu. So now multiplying term by term, we get eta times eta, which gets which gives us delta alpha nu. Then we've got eta times y, which gives eta nu nu y alpha nu plus h nu nu eta alpha nu plus h times y, which is of the order of h square, so we will neglect that. And this is delta alpha nu. So simplifying our life. So, so this guy simplifies with that guy, and we've got this equal to minus h nu nu eta alpha nu. Now we multiply that but some by some kind of new kappa raised uh, okay. Now we obtain delta kappa nu y alpha nu equal to minus h mu nu. Eta alpha nu eta kappa nu or 
y kappa nu equals to minus h mu nu eta kappa mu eta sorry this should be alpha kappa alpha nu okay from now on we use eta alpha beta eta mu nu to raise and lower indices in that case we simply see that g upper index mu nu is eta upper index mu nu and this thing here is just h with indices up so the inverse metric is eta minus h with indices uh, with raised indices and i think this is it for today uh, thank you very much for the lecture do you have any questions okay i don't see any thank you very much for participating and uh, see you next week